Oh, okay. I guess I wasn't being recorded. Okay. Okay, we're going to continue with interconnection networks. I've covered the, we've, you covered a lot of things, as if you remember yesterday. We covered topology, we covered uh, buffering and flow control, uh, uh, and we covered routing. Uh, now, we left off at interconnection network performance, and actually we covered some of these slides, but this is to jog your memory from yesterday. As I said, uh, a lot of networks are evaluated this way. Actually, a lot of systems are evaluated this way. You have a load on the system, and you have a response coming from the system, and that response looks like this, usually, in terms of how long it takes. As you increase the load, the response shoots up. And in, in case of interconnection networks, uh, latency is one characteristic, throughput is another. This is called the saturation throughput over here. And as we discussed, you have a minimum latency given by your topology design, and you have a minimum latency given by your routing algorithm on top of that. Because of inefficiency in your routing algorithm, you may not be able to exploit all of the latency, minimum latency that's really offered by your topology. And on top of that, you have a minimum latency that's dictated by the flow control mechanisms that you employ, buffering and flow control. And that's called the zero load latency. And if you make these efficient, you'll push these down, of course. And if your topology is really good, then you'll push this down to almost zero. Uh, and on the other side over here, you start with a maximum throughput given by your topology again, and then you lose some efficiency because of your routing and then you lose some, efficient, some more efficiency because of your flow control and buffering choices. As a result, you get to this asymptotic uh, point over here, which is your saturation throughput. And as I also said, you would really like to operate somewhere over here and probably not over here. Here your latencies shoot up and you, you run into a lot of congestion potentially. And we also discussed that uh, the idea of source throttling essentially tries to get you to some place to operate over here by throttling the sources, throttling the injection rates down into the system. Okay, so this is very fundamental. And again, this is not specific to the networks, uh, this particular curve. You could probably apply it to humans also, right? If you keep injecting loads into humans, humans also increase their latencies, right? Yes. So you interpreted the input charge condensation in basic preferred and optimal settings. That's right, yeah. So that's another thing, yes. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, this is basically after injection, how long it takes. That's the latency. But I mean, you could also include the injection, uh, that part, waiting at the source as well, right? But that's, a, that's another curve. Okay, so we've also discussed this. This is the ideal latency. I'm not gonna go over this right now. This is the actual latency. Actual latency is dictated by how many hops you have and how much uh, uh, latency do you, uh, do you see due to contention. And this was one other example. And we said packet latency, round trip latency, saturation la throughput, these are network performance metrics. And we're gonna talk about application level performance more going forward because in the end, if you're designing a system, you care about application level performance and late, these, these metrics are may be interesting, may be interesting to analyze the network, but they may not tell you a lot about what's happening to applications, right? This is very similar to what we discussed uh, in memory controllers, for example. You may want to ma maximize the data throughput from the memory controller, but that may not be correlating very well with your, with your application level performance, like slowdowns. Okay. So this is where we really left off yesterday. Basically, I, I, I promised that I was going to get rid of buffers for you. <laughs> so we, uh, and that's, that's what we're going to look into now. How, uh, how, how can you design networks a little bit more efficiently? And I say this to provoke people uh, because buffering has been so much the mindset in designing networks that uh, when, peop when we first started uh, like pushing for having bufferless networks, uh, it, was, it was a big change. But this is actually a really old idea, as I said yesterday, right? This is uh, from Paul Baran from 1960s, 1962 actually. When, when internet was first being think thought about, people said, okay, why don't we have bufferless networks? But it turns out there are issues with bufferless networks that may not work well for the internet. But, so okay, we're gonna examine some buffering and routing choices, especially within the context of on-chip networks uh, right now. So we've talked about interconnects in general. We didn't talk about the off-chip versus on-chip differences that much. So that's what I'm going to start with right now. On-chip, if you want to have a scalable system, you can have a system that looks like this. In this case, you have a two-dimensional mesh, but it doesn't have to be a two-dimensional mesh. You can interconnect the components in uh, using any kind of topology that we discussed, right? You can connect cores, caches, memory controllers. And we said that buses and crossbars are not scalable, so people are looking at rings, hierarchical rings, meshes that look like this. And 
usually people look at things like uh, things that are packet switched, but you know the difference between packet switching and circuit switching. Circuit switching can have a lot of advantages on chip also actually, uh, but we're not going to discuss that right now. That's another dimension. And this is one of the most commonly used topologies today, 2D mesh. You could argue that that's not necessarily good, but it's very easy to lay out on chip. And the on-chip network primarily serves cache misses and memory requests and coherence requests today. Basically, anything that's related to memory. So this is another example over here, uh, maybe a bigger network. And if you look at the router inside, uh, the, we built this virtual channel-based router, if you remember. And it's a, uh, it's a lot of real estate, basically. As you can see, there are a lot, there's a lot of buffering. Uh, we added these virtual channels. And in this case, you see five ports uh, from four, uh, one from each neighbor and one from the processing element that's connected to the router. And you see five outside ports. So you have a big crossbar over here also, uh, which is it in so itself a network, actually. And you could actually deconstruct this crossbar into smaller pieces, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, there's control logic that's dedicated. We didn't really go into the router design a lot. Uh, I don't want to. It's, it's, it's interesting, but uh, so how do you design the routing unit? How do you allocate these virtual channels? How do you allocate the switch? Who do you allocate it to? Uh, do you do it speculatively? Uh, do you do it non-speculatively to overlap the latency? There's a lot of design choices that go into the router itself also. But we're going to skip that. If you're really interested, you can read the papers, uh, some of which are referenced, or you can, uh, you can look at my own, uh, longer online lectures. So let's take a look at the differences between on-chip versus off-chip. Uh, on-chip networks have become more interesting recently, and there are some clear differences uh, because of the trade-offs that you have on chip versus off chip. So on chip, you have low latency between the cores. So your interconnect may, be, may perhaps uh, be designed with that in mind. There are no pin constraints. That's one good thing, uh, meaning that your routers are not constrained by the pins. It may have high radix, for example, because of that. Whereas if your router is sitting on a chip by itself, it's pin constrained. You have rich wiring resources, which is basically the same thing over here and very high bandwidth as a result of this, and so you can actually enable simpler coordination across the chip within a single chip, right? Which may be a lot, much harder to do if you're actually uh, off-chip. So the disadvantages and constraints of on-chip is you have 2D substrate, and this limits your topologies. Uh, uh, you have to somehow build uh, these wires, and if you have actually too many wires going on top of each other, like the point-to-point -point connections we looked at last time, that may be very difficult to build on-chip because you have limited 3D wiring resources. Uh, energy and power consumption is a key concern, and this, is, this may be actually even worse on chip. We're going to talk about that. Uh, and complex algorithms are probably undesirable, whereas if you're off chip, maybe you have also uh, a lot of latency, and you can actually have a lot more complexity in your routing algorithm, because you may have a lot of time as well. Right? OK, and logic area constrains the use of wiring resource. Even though you may have actually a lot of wiring resources, the area uh, overhead actually constrains the use of those. Okay, any questions? We're going to cover more on chip, off chip. Okay, so cost, in terms of cost, off chip, cost is dominated by channels, pins, connectors, and cables. On chip, cost is really storage and switches. Wires are usually plentiful on chip. Uh, this leads to networks with many white channels and few buffers on chip comparatively, uh, but we will, we'll get back to that. In terms of channel characteristics, on chip you have short distance, low latency, and you have RC lines on chip. You need repeaters uh, at, at, at some millimeters, basically. This is based on some technology, of course. You can put logic and repeaters, of course, right? And the workloads, I think, uh, traditionally these networks have been designed for supercomputers or data centers, whereas on chip you have a different type of workload, right? It's really the cache traffic that you're catering to, and the characteristics of that workload may be very different from whatever you're doing off chip. That's why I think it's important to consider the workloads that you have on chip when you're designing these networks. Okay, so we've actually, uh, if you're really interested in these differences, we have written a paper that looks at uh, on chip networks and it's really differences and uh, similarities to uh, off chip networking. And we actually look at uh, the effect of bufferless networks on congestion control and uh, issues related to congestion collapse uh, in the on chip networks versus off chip network. I'm not going to cover that uh, over here. But I'm going to t uh, pick something, which is the buffers. As I said, I'm going to pick on these buffers. <laughs> and we're, we're going to talk about that. So basically, uh, the mindset has been these networks are designed with buffers, right? 
there, uh, but as I, as I said, there are three, three ways of, three fundamental ways of handling contention in a router. Whenever you get two packets that need to go to the same output port, you have three ways. One is buffer one of them, or both of them. The second is drop one of them. And the third one is deflect one of them, meaning misroute. But overwhelmingly, uh, at least the on-chip network literature uh, has been buffer. <laughs> Dropping and deflecting was not really considered as much. Uh, there, there is some literature, of course, that looks at deflecting, for example, the chaos router. But that's only when uh, buffers become full. That's, all, that's actually a very interesting work from University of Washington in the early 1990s. It's called the chaos router, if you're interested in that. Uh, OK, so let's pick on this buffering. Uh, if you, so buffering, as we discussed, you need a lot of buffering. Uh, and you need to manage the buffer, buffers. There's complexity. And you need to size the buffers such that you can tolerate this round trip latency of managing the buffers, because you need to communicate the availability of buffers to the downstream routers. And that takes some time and handshake. And because of that, your buffers need to be even larger than they really, really need to be. Uh, but they are important for high network throughput. If you actually want to inject into a network, and if you don't have buffers, you cannot inject into the network, basically, uh, because your router doesn't have enough buffering. Right? They essentially, they increase total available bandwidth in the network. And this is what the curve looks like, uh, at least pictorially. Yes? That's true, yes. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, here I give the benefit of doubt over here. Yeah, your minimum latency probably increases as well because you need to have the buffer management and your router may be more complex. But we're going to look at that later on. So this may actually start from somewhere here, right? That's what you're saying. The large buffers may start from here and then go over here. Good point. So I cannot change the slide from 2008. <laughs> okay. Basically, uh, this is what you would expect, at least in terms of uh, throughput. As your injection rate increases, uh, you get higher saturation throughput with larger buffers. If you reduce the buffer sizes, uh, your, uh, uh, basically you're saturated at a much earlier point in the network. Now the question we wanted to ask was, uh, how, do, how does this change in a real on-chip network? So buffers are good for throughput, but buffers consume significant energy and power. They consume dynamic energy when you read and write, and static energy when you're not occupying them. And they add complexity and latency. We covered a lot of this. Logic for buffer management, virtual channel allocation, some sort of flow control, credit-based, on and off. It doesn't matter. They all complicate uh, the management. And they require significant chip area. Uh, take this with a grain of salt. There have been prototype chips that didn't really optimize for buffers. But in some cases, they actually show that uh, uh, approximately 75% of the total on-chip network area is really buffers. But of course, this depends on how much you optimize your buffers and uh, like how, how big of wires you have. So it really depends on how, what your network design. But they do consume significant area. I'll give you some other uh, examples of this. So the key question we asked was, can we get rid of buffers? How, what is the impact of this on application? So basically, there are several questions. How, is your, uh, how much throughput do you lose? How, how is latency affected? if you go from this buffers and no buffers. And up to what injection rates can we use bufferless routing? Are there realistic scenarios in, which, uh, in, in network on chips where you operate at injection rates, uh, over uh, maybe over here, where you don't really care that you have buffers or you don't have buffers, right? That's the idea. If your application is always operating over here, why are you designing the network to be here? OK, so basically, can we achieve energy reduction? If so, how much? Uh, these are my co-author co slides, so he's very creative with these things. OK, can we, can we reduce area and complexity? So answers are in the paper, but I'm, I'm going to talk about part of the paper. And you know the idea by now. Basically, the idea is I covered this. Uh, this is all, uh, uh, we want to always forward all incoming flits to some output port. Right? You may have a productive direction for the flit, but you may not have a productive direction, which means that you send the flit to a non-productive direction. This is called misrouting or deflection routing. It's also called hot potato routing, the seminal paper by Baran, the earlier version of us in 1962. It was hot potato routing, basically. You have a hot potato, you cannot hold it, you send it to some other router. And no router can hold that hot potato, basically. Which means that you're really using the links as your buffers. There are no buffers, assume, and then you're really utilizing the links. And the pipeline registers, of course. Assuming you have pipelining, the, the stuff sits in the pipeline registers. And we're not eliminating the pipeline registers. You need pipelining for high frequency. Yes. 
Uh, I mean, there. Yeah, there. Yeah, basically, it immediately goes out. Yes. Yeah, but but you you normally have pipelining, so you you need to have some pipeline registers anyway, right? So you get some level of frequency. So we make we take advantage of the pipeline registers. Okay. Okay, but we don't have. So if you go back uh, to this thing. So you may have some. Oh, where is this thing? Okay, sorry. Actually, I'll probably have a picture forward. I should have gone forward. But these are the buffers that we're talking about. These are when a packet comes, they, it gets buffered in this virtual channels, yeah. FIFO queues. We don't do that, basically. There might be a pipeline register over here so that you can achieve the clocking. But you don't need to put every single packet into one of these buffers. OK. Okay, so hot potato routing, we've already discussed the idea. If two things contend for the same output port, one of them takes it, the other one gets, oh, this is buffered. In bless, one of them gets deflected. Basically, it goes away from its destination. This is called misrouting. It's non-minimal by nature, as we discussed, right? As a result, it will have the problem of live lock. Yes? No, no, we don't wait. We, we still do flit-based routing. So you're deflecting each flit. But uh, in, in our case, it turns out, I mean, uh, so the, if you go into the paper, you could adapt it to the wormhole routing, where you have a flit, and then, uh, ta and then uh, you have a header packet, you have middle packets, and then tail packets. You could adapt it to this. It works, but it's a, a bit of a mess. Or you could actually redefine the flits, and flits behave like small packets. So you have headers in each flit. Basically, we do flit, by flit, level, uh, uh, flit level routing. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Basically, you, 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 your overhead increases a little bit because you're, you're routing at the flit level. Yeah. Yes, you need to reassemble in the end. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes? Everything. Yeah, injected packets also. Whenever you're injecting, basically, you need to ensure that uh, you, have, you have one output port available. If you don't, you don't inject. Yeah, you don't get to inject, yes. Yeah. yeah. But injection, you can, in, that's also equal, right? You have injection and ejection. You don't inject, basically, you eject it immediately. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so that's a good point. This doesn't work in all networks. This works if your output ports are greater than or equal to the number of input ports. OK, uh, Okay. so this is the buffered router. Uh, basically, we want to get rid of this somehow and get rid of all of this complexity. As you see, there's complexity, the back networks for credit. And we want to somehow do the split ranking and port prioritization. So this is the arbitration policy now. We want to create a ranking of over all incoming flits, including from the injection. And for a given flit in this ranking, find the best free output port and apply to each flit in the order of ranking. That's the idea. Then the question is, how do you do the ranking? So this is the flit bless, flit version of it. I'm not going to cover the warm hold, uh, warm bless, warm version of it. Uh, basically, each flit is routed independently, meaning you, uh, there's some overhead of, over for that. And you, you have all this first arbit arbitration. Why do we do all this first arbitration? We want to ensure live lock freedom, basically, in this case. And all this first, you have all this first ranking, and you assign the flit to a productive port if possible. Otherwise, you assign to non-productive port uh, based on the rank. So the oldest flit always gets its productive port, basically, in this case. Which means that you will not have live lock in the system because oldest flit is guaranteed to make uh, correct progress. Yes, forward progress. Yeah, basically, you need to sync somehow. That's right. So this assumes you need, you need to have some sort of common timestamp. So <laughs> that's true. If you, if you, count, if you count hops, then uh, you don't have a ground truth because everybody may be increasing in terms of hops. And you may still have live lock, actually. We're going to get back to this live lock problem in a little bit. But basically, if you have a common timestamp, whenever someone injects, they put the timestamp, you're live lock free. No question about that. But the complexity is very high, actually. 
But this paper ignores that complexity. This paper assumes that you could do it, and it looks at the potential, and then we're going to talk about another paper and, as to how to really build the router. Okay. So, okay, network topology. This can be applied to most topologies. Uh, basically, number of input ports and number of output ports. Actually, this, there's something wrong here. I don't know. But it should be greater than or equal to number of input ports uh, at every router. Otherwise, you cannot deflect, right? You, you have nowhere to deflect. But, but most interesting topologies, at least, uh, have that property. And every router also should be reachable from every other router. This is also important. Otherwise, you may not get to your destination, right? Or you need to be very complicated in terms of how you deflect. Okay, so the flow control and injection policy, it's completely local in this case. There is no global flow control, credit-based flow control. Uh, you inject whenever an input port is free, and that's it basically. There is no deadlock. Every fleet is always moving. So we convert the problem of deadlock to the problem of live lock basically. And there's no live lock, as I said, assuming you do the oldest first ranking correctly. So these are the advantages and disadvantages of bufferless routing on chip. Uh, basically, you have no buffers. That's good. Purely local flow control. No credit flows, no virtual channels, simplified router design. No deadlocks, no live locks with, if you do it right. Uh, adaptivity, this is also important. Uh, it's a, it's a, this is minimal, uh, minimal, uh, non-minimal adaptive routing, right? Uh, bufferless routing by nature is non-minimal adaptive. And you can deflect around congested areas. And it's your, if your congestion grows, you, you keep deflecting around that area. And then hopefully you will go around that area magically by deflections and reach your destination. Yes? No, only, uh, only in the router, basically. So you have four inputs, let's say, and they need to go to four outputs. You want to do the oldest first prioritization such that the oldest packet gets its choice, okay, first choice. Who, who oh, basically, that, that was his question. Uh, there's a, uh, we're assuming there's a timestamp that says whenever you inject the packet, you timestamp it, and everybody agrees on that timestamp. Yeah. If that's not true, that's a bit hard to do, actually. But I'm going to solve that problem in a much more simpler way later on, hopefully. <laughs> okay, so actually you can reduce the router latency because you get rid of a lot of these buffers and management overhead, and you can read the paper for this, but we're going to look at something different to, uh, later on. And you get area savings. The disadvantage is, of course, you get increased latency because uh, at, it increased average latency because of when, whenever you're congested, you get reduced bandwidth. You get increased buffering at the receiver because, as some of you uh, figured out, uh, the, now you do flit level routing and somebody needs to reassemble the flits at the end, right? If you're doing buffer, uh, buffered wormhole based routing, everything arrives in order and you can put, uh, you can, the packet is almost reassembled at the, when it, when it uh, arrives at the destination, right? Because remember wormhole routing? The head is followed by the uh, body, and the body is followed by the tail, and they all move like a worm and because they're buffered, and they all follow the same path in the network, which could be a downside, by the way, in terms of congestion. Uh, but they all arrive at the destination as a worm, and you don't need to reassemble and figure out which flit belongs to what because you know exactly what the worm is. Whereas here, all flits can come from different places in the, in the network because flits are routed independently. As a result, you need to reassemble in the destination. And that actually increases the buffering at the receiver, and this paper analyzes that increased buffering. But in the next paper, we're going to have a solution to that also. OK. So you need header information at each flit. Again, if the baseline is wormhole routing, routing you need header information only at the head flit, right? Whereas here, we're doing flit level routing, uh, and this is necessary. You could reduce it with warm level bliss, but I think warm level bliss is actually not so nice. Uh, you can read the paper in terms of the complexities. If you, if you do deflection routing and when you're doing warms, you get into situations where you cannot arbitrate between two warms, right? Because on, you can only arbitrate with the head of the warm, but while you're transmitting the body of the warm, you cannot arbitrate. As a result, you got, you're into a not so nice situation. So wormhole routing, by definition, is easier to implement on a buffered substrate. Uh, okay, all this first arbitration is complex and quality of service becomes difficult, but we're going to talk about that later on. So impact on energy, we were also interested in the impact on energy, so we're going to evaluate some of that. So there's router latency reduction in the paper. You can take a look at it. I'm not going to cover it. So. Well, all this first, uh, not really. <laughs> 
All this verse is good for, uh, uh, in this case, live like freedom and non-starvation, probably. But it's not good for QoS at the application level because an application that's injecting a lot of requests naturally appears older, right, to the thing that's arbitrating. So Q QoS is, uh, what if you have packets uh, of different classes, let's say. In, in, a, in a buffered network with virtual channels, different virtual channels can actually encode different priorities. And uh, that way you can easily arbitrate, or t well, assuming you have all the overheads of buffering on top of that. Whereas here, you don't have any buffers, so how do you handle the quality of service becomes an issue. Okay, so, okay, we wanted to basically look at the performance, and this is one example. This is the bad news over here. This is synthetic traces. This is how evaluation has been done a lot in interconnection networks. This is the injection rate but in terms of splits per cycle per node. Uh, and we're assuming uh, uniform random injection. Basically, uh, uniform, at a uniform rate, you inject uh, to a random destination, randomly selected destination. And the rate is determined by this injection rate. So if you look over here, uh, let's see. Uh, this minimal adaptive routing is the baseline buffered router with some amount of buffering, a good amount of buffering. And the routing is minimal adaptive, so uh, there's a special algorithm for this. And as you can see, the throughput is pretty high. Basically, uh, at 0 0.5 splits per cycle per node, only that's, that's, what, that's when you really saturate. Whereas if you actually have splits less with one cycle or two cycle latency, you're over here. And if you do warm less, it's around over here also. So basically, the, this is not good news. We're definitely reducing throughput. But this is a synthetic workload. The key question is, where, where are real applications? Right? And real applications turn out to be closer to here. They're not really uniform random, first of all. And also, uh, in, in, if, you, if you have uh, on-chip network traffic, your injection rates into the network is low. It depends on where you put the network, of course. But in our case, the network was uh, you inject into the network uh, after you get an L1 cache miss. So L1 cache actually filters out a lot of your traffic. Right? If your L1 cache is really effective, if you have a very good workload that has 90% hit rate, you're filtering out a lot of your traffic to begin with, and your network loads are relatively low. Okay, so this is, yeah, there's more in the paper, but uh, in this case, we're actually assuming perfect L2 caches, not perfect L1 caches. L1 caches are still real. And if you look over here, uh, basically, you, you may think that maybe it doesn't matter. <laughs> in terms of performance, this is what you get. This is weighted speed up. Uh, in a four by four network, your performance is really not sensitive to uh, uh, bufferless routing versus dimension order routing or minimal adaptive routing. So buffering really is not helping you that much. It's helping you a little bit over here, as you can see. This is, these are the buffered versions, uh, dimension order, minimal adaptive, and ROM is another uh, valence algorithm-like routing mechanism. Uh, and these are the bufferless versions. So there's a slight improvement with buffering, but not much. That's the key realization over here. And, uh, oh, basically it's the, this is a four by four network. Uh, you have uh, eight nodes over here uh, that is running an application and eight other nodes that are doing caching and memory. But this is more interesting. I think this is a four by four network. You have 16 nodes running the application called MILC and also there are caches, uh, 16 nodes doing caching. So this is the more interesting part. I, I, would, I would focus on this one. These are some other examples to show you actually gain benefit with bufferless routing. So you basically lose a little bit throughput, but not that much. And why is the system, uh, this is the system performance. Okay. So that's the, uh, basically you get very little performance degradation with less, less than 4% in the dense network. And with router latency one, you can even outperform the baseline because you reduce the router latency. And that was our assumption. But I'm going to deconstruct that in a little bit because it's not that easy actually to build the bufferless router to begin with. And these are the energies. This is, this is even more interesting perhaps. You get, if you look over here, we get rid of almost all of the buffering energy as you can see. Link energy increases because we're actually deflecting more. You're using the links more. And uh, this is the router energy. And router energy also increases a little bit compared to the baseline because you're using the routers more also because of the deflections. But overall energy consumption reduces significantly. And take these with a grain of salt. This was, the, this was our first cut, basically. We're gonna do a second cut. Okay, so I think the key observation is injection rates that we observe in these on-chip networks are not extremely high on average because the network itself is self-throttling and there are caches that you have 
uh, what, what does self-throttling mean? Basically, you may inject a lot, okay? But you cannot inject indefinitely from a processor. It's not an open loop system, it's a closed loop system, right? You need to wait for the responses to come back. And processors have limited capability for injection into the network. Even if they injected a lot, they cannot keep on injecting because their buffers are full after some point internally. Whereas this, this figure over here and the interconnection network designs from the past come from this viewpoint where, oh, you keep injecting all the time, right? Yes? So in this case, uh, yeah, we, don't, we didn't model the I.O. and DMAs. This is really only workload. Yeah. yeah, it could grow. There's, uh, that's true, yes. Yeah. Yeah, we discussed the I.O. Yester uh, yesterday with uh, the couple DMA. I think there could be other ideas over there to look into. Okay. So basically, for bursts and temporary hotspots, we're using the network links as buffers. And that's the idea. Okay, so these are the conclusions that we had in 2009. Uh, uh, basically, for a very wide range of application and network systems, buffers are not needed uh, in the NOC. You get significant energy savings. You get significant area savings. Take that with a grain of salt. Right, this was actually back of the envelope. Uh, you have a simplified router and network design, uh, and performance slowdown is minimal. And if you actually re can reduce your router latency, this can even increase. So basically, we made a strong case for rethinking the NOC design and future researchers look at how to actually do this uh, in real. And this is a paper. I didn't assign it. Your third paper is something else. Uh, okay. So clearly there are issues. Live lock is something we've discussed. Router complexity is something we're going to discuss. And performance and congestion at high loads, actually. So you don't always have these low loads. There are cases where you have high loads. And how do you actually provide high performance at high loads becomes important. And we've actually looked at all of these three. We didn't look at this one as much, but it's, there, there's something open over here. So let's take a look at some of them. So the next step for us was to actually really go into the issues and try to build this bufferless router. I'm going to talk about that. Any questions so far? Yes? Yeah, there, so there's no easy way we could compare. We've started with a packet switch network. Uh, and I really like circuit switching, actually. I think it's a really good idea, especially when you're doing streaming through the network. But we, didn't, we, didn't really, we couldn't really compare. We wanted the packet switch bufferless network to be more general. But if you can somehow combine circuit switching uh, with packet switch bufferless, I think that's also very interesting. <laughs> Say it again. Some of like, what's this? Yeah, that, that's true. <laughs> that's true. I mean, you could, you could combine it. I agree. But we didn't do it, right? In, in our case, we're still doing dynamic packet switching in every router. If you actually use circuit switching on top of that a little bit, maybe you can actually make it, make it even better, more efficient. I agree. I think we're getting closer. <laughs> OK, so let's move to the next thing over here. Basically. Our motivation here was bufferless routing is very, very interesting to examine, and there are significant potential benefits. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't address the complexities in the router. Uh, you can only do so much in a paper, I think. Uh, uh, and it turns out the router actually becomes very complex because of the old dispersed arbitration. And I'm going to give you an example of this. You get a long critical path, and we already said that you get large reassembly buffers. So we're going to try to fix these problems and make the entire network bufferless as much as possible. Basically, we'd like to obtain uh, uh, these benefits while simplifying the router in order to make bufferless NOCs practical. So these are the two major problems that you need to solve in a bufferless router. You must provide live lock freedom. A packet should not be deflected forever. And you must reassemble packets upon arrival. Right? This is the flick that's routing unit packets, one or more multiple flits, as we've discussed. So this is the high-level view of the router. You have a local node. And this is the bufferless router. You have a deflection routing logic, and you have uh, an ejection logic that puts things into the reassembly buffers. So we're going to solve this problem over here, and we're going to solve the second problem over here. So let's take a look. So how do you provide live lock freedom? Previous work says you need to sort the packets by age, common age, and then assign in age order to output port. So 
we did this in RTL, and we figured out that actually your critical path is 43% longer than a buffer routing. So this doesn't sound good, right? We got rid of a lot of the complexity in the router, and we ended up with a, a still higher critical path. And this other thing is the assembly buffers must be sized for the worst case. We're going to look at that. Basically, you're injecting packets into the net, uh, flits into the network, and there are a lot of flits. And your, uh, your reassembly buffers must basically uh, cater for the case where uh, you have a lot of flits. Uh, basically, you can, it can take in all of the flits that are destined for this destination. And it turns out that that is pretty large. It's about four kilobytes per node in an eight by eight network. We're going to look at that later on. Let's take a look at the first one. So live lock freedom in previous works. What stops a flit from deflecting forever? That's the key question over here. You timestamp all flits. All the splits are assigned their desired port. So basically, you form a total order among the flits. The key question is, is this total order necessary? So basically, this split uh, gets guaranteed progress. And once the split is done, this split gets its guaranteed progress. Once this, this split is done, this split gets guaranteed progress. And every router prioritizes the oldest split it sees. And you have a total order. And new traffic is the lowest priority, as you can see. So what is the cost of this? That's the first question. So basically, the router must sort flits by age. So you need to have a sorting network uh, to go into the router, uh, well, to do the arbitration in the router. And this is one way of designing the sorting network, as you can see. Th there are three comparator stages for four, four flits. So let's assume that these are your four flits, one, two, three, four. And those are the ages also. One is the highest priority. So you basically do the sorting network. Sorting network basically compares the ages and then puts the lowest age to the top. That's the function of these two by two blocks over here. In this case, this is what happens. Well, I don't know if what I said is true. Okay. Okay, that's better. So yeah, you need to be more careful in the design, of course. So in the end, you get this one, two, three, four. Right. That's that's what you really want. You want to get an order uh, among these, and you started with some random order over here with timestamps, and you would like this basically. Now you know the priorities, right, of the different flits. So after sorting, flits are assigned to output force in priority order. Right? That's the next step. We just, we just figured out the ordering. Now we need to assign ports. So port assignment of younger flits depends on that of the older flits. That's the downside of deflection routing, actually. You need to do that port assignment. There's a sequential dependence in the port allocator. So the first flit, that's the highest priority, it basically wants east, and it will get east from the grantor. The second, and then it will say, okay, east is allocated. You have north, south, west, ava west available. Second flit wants east. Too bad. It doesn't have east, so it gets deflected, assuming east is the only thing it wants. And then south and west are available. The third flit wants south, so it's granted. And uh, the last flit wants south. It doesn't get it, so it's deflected. So basically, you have the sequential dependence in the port allocation. Yes. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Better solution in terms of probably uh, uh, figuring out what flits are allocated. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The problem is that that increases the uh, critical path of the router even more, right? Because now you need to consider more options, and that actually adds more area as well as uh, a critical path delay to the router. I agree with you. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. But we, we want to actually reduce it compared to the buffered router. Exactly, but I agree. This is not the best solution in terms of uh, your your utilization of your productive output ports. You don't want sequential dependence in the allocate. You you actually actually there there were some other proposals that looked at doing this in parallel. And if you actually do a lot of things in parallel and pick the best one, in the end, that's good. You get a better allocation, but your critical path latency increases even more. And you may actually need to break it into multiple cycles, and that actually makes it even worse. Okay, okay. So basically, this is. 
uh, this is uh, what we end up with. You have a priority sort in terms of ordering, and you have a port allocator. The baseline buffered router actually doesn't do this. This doesn't have sequential dependence on the port allocation, and it doesn't have a priority sort because it's, it doesn't require all this first. What they do is they do round robin, for example, in, across the virtual channels. It's not the best algorithm, but simple. Right? If you do round robin, you easily you, you don't really need any of this. Right? So it turns out this critical path is 43% longer than uh, a buffered router. Then the key question we asked was, is this really the right way to provide live lock freedom in a network like this? Is there a cheaper way to guarantee live lock freedom? And then, the, uh, then we wanted to be minimalist. So if you want to be mil minimalist, you want to think about what is really the necessary thing for live lock freedom. And basically, you wanted to attack this total order. So you don't really need a total order over here. All you need is it's enough to pick one flit and prioritize it until it arrives at its destination and ensure that any flit is eventually picked. That's the idea. So it's really a very partial order, this golden flit versus everything else. Once a flit becomes golden, it's guaranteed to be delivered. And every flit becomes golden at some point in time. And this makes, makes the router extremely simple, as we will see in a little bit. So what does the golden flit routing require? First of all, you only need to properly route the golden flit. Everything else you can misroute. Yes, performance may go down if you do that. But for live lock freedom, you're golden if you actually route only the golden flit correctly. So basically, no need for full sort. You just need to distinguish golden, not golden. And no need for sequential allocation because you just need to allocate the golden flit in this case. So you relaxed a lot of the problems over here. Yeah, let's talk about the golden. I mean the order? It doesn't need to be, no. So things can, yeah. things can come. Exactly, yeah. There, there's no. Things can come and, uh, as long as every, every flit has the opportunity to become golden, you, you're live lock free. There, the age is really a red herring, right? You don't care about the age in the end. You may care about age in terms of fairness at some point. Exactly, exactly. That's the key. So you, you have to make sure everybody can be picked to be golden. Everybody has to be picked to be golden. So let's do that. First, let's do the routing first. So let's start the golden flit in a two-input router. Basically, we are going to uh, start with this basic block. Uh, you basically, step one is to pick a winning flit. You have two flits that are I I at your input. You pick the golden flit if there is one. Otherwise, you pick one of the random ones. And you steer the winning flit to its desired output and deflect the other flit. So a golden flit is always routed towards its destination. So let's take a look at, and each block actually makes its decision. There's, no, there's only one golden flit in the network. Yeah, in the entire network. Now we're going to later we expand it with golden and silver flit because actually if you have two levels of priority, it's better in terms of performance. But it doesn't buy you anything in terms of lilac freedom. Lilac freedom requires only one golden. So each block uh, makes decisions independently over here. Deflection essentially now is a distributed decision. So let's take a look at that. So uh, I'm going to give you an example. So we have this permutation network, two by two blocks. You, golden is this golden one. And uh, in this case, north and east, basically the router asks the question, uh, this, this thing, the router asks the question, this is also a router. Everything's a router, and you build a bigger router from the router, as you can see. Uh, so this asks the question, do I have anything golden? No, I don't have anything golden. So randomly, I'm going to pick one of them, and randomly happens to be the red one. So you swap. In this case, gold, uh, the, ca the same question is asked over here. Do I have anything golden? Yes, I have something golden. So this is going to win. And it wants west, so it should really go west. That's the idea. Now, you have these two things. Yeah, we swapped, OK? Now, the, this router asked the question, and sorry, I didn't explain it very well, but uh, this green block is what this wants. Uh, this red, red output port is what this wants, and this golden output port is what this wants, and this blue output port is what this wants. That's why, we're, ideally, we want to get there. Right? That's why we swap this uh, red one. So let me go back to the initial decision. Initial decision is, there is no golden thing over here. I'm going to randomly pick one and prioritize, and the randomly, this happens to be picked. And this router knows that it needs to route this one to here so that it can get its productive port. That's why it makes the decision of swapping. That's the idea. 
So here, there's a golden one. Golden one gets the priority. And golden one wants to go here, which means that there is no reason to swap it. Right? You send it through this way. OK, so now the next level of decisions. Here, uh, there is no golden one. You pick one randomly. It happens to be the green one. And green one wants to go here, so you swap it. And in this case, they happen to get to their productive output force nicely. And then here, we have a golden one. Golden one wins the arbitration because it is the most important one. And there's no swap. So a golden one goes here. This one's the only one that's deflected in this case. That's it. OK, we're going to talk about that next. So how, do you, how does the golden become golden? Let, before that, let's take a look at this. Basically, we get rid of all of this and replace it with this very simple uh, 2 by 2 permutation network of 2 by 2 routers. OK. Oh, how did the golden one become golden? I don't have slides on that. <laughs> OK. That's interesting. Really? What happened to my slides? <laughs> Let me see if I have slides. If not, I'm going to explain to you how did the golden one become golden. No, no. So in this case, actually, the, the way we made things golden, I'm going to explain because apparently I don't have slides, which is really interesting at best. This way I can ask questions in the exam and if people are not here. <laughs> That's not their purpose, but <laughs> that just occurred to me now. <laughs> okay, so how did the golden one become golden? So what is the minimal thing that you can do? First of all, when something becomes golden, you need to keep it golden until it arrives to its destination, right? Which means that you need to have a time t. This is the uh, minimum number of time. Or, or say, uh, this is the maximum time needed to route the highest priority flit across the entire network. So a golden uh, a, a priority flit across the entire network. So you can compute this based on your network size and the latencies. Right? It's every router you spend some time. If you're the highest priority flit, you have a minimum amount of time to go through that router. And you have a maximum number of hops you, that you can traverse based on your outing algorithm. And you can determine, oh, it takes at most t cycles to route the highest priority flit across the entire network. And when a golden flit becomes golden, it has to stay golden for that t time period. Right. Now the question is, what is the minimal thing that you, can, that you need to, uh, to, to decide the golden? So we are in an on-chip network setting. Right? Meaning, we, ha we know exactly how many things uh, that different cores can inject. Let's say we have 12 cores, right? So basically, whenever you're injecting into the network, you normally have some buffers. So you need to buffer the thing that you inject internally. Right? And each core, or whatever agent, you have is assigned a buffer ID. Now, what does this mean? Uh, so, for example, you have uh, a buffer ID from uh, core zero, from zero to uh, I don't know, sixty-three. Let's say it can inject. It, it it has this sixty-four things that it can inject. And then you have this buffer ID core one, zero through sixty-three, and you have this over here. So everybody can inject sixty-four at, at most sixty-four. So which means that you have a unique ID for any possible home location of a given flit. Now what we do is very simple and stupid. At the beginning of time, you say this unique ID is the golden for T cycles. After T cycles, you pick this unique ID is golden. After T cycles, you pick this unique ID is golden. After t cycles, you pick this unique ID is golden. And that solves the problem. <laughs> Who is what? Everybody knows in the, route, in the system. <laughs> it's synchronized. <laughs> so basically, the routers know who is golden at any point in time based on the time. So assuming you have synchronized time, every, everybody knows who is the golden flit. Right? Uh -huh. 
That's right. We, we ba basically, that golden slot is wasted. Exactly. But it's okay. If live lock is not the common case, Exactly. This is just against live lock. There is, there is no other purpose of this. Yes. Yes. Well, too bad. Uh, so there, there's no golden flit, let's say. <laughs> there's a golden slot. So I just redefined golden flit to be golden slot. And slot is the ID of the thing that you inject. And that ID happens to be golden at, the, at, a, per, at, at a certain time. And if something has been injected with that ID, it's going to be golden for that period of time. If something has not been injected, you're going to waste that ID. But eventually, you will get to, if a flit has been circling around for some time, eventually, all of the routers will say, oh, this thing has become golden. So we're going to prioritize it for T cycles. And this is, there's no communication overhead. Everybody just knows, right? At this time slot, this ID is go this, this slot is golden. Make sense? Yeah. Yes? So uh, the fact that you can do dual uh, golden flits with the Jupyter Notebook and the Cube uh, spread the flit rate, uh -huh. is that because the Yeah, so uh, basically, you, you, we, don't, we don't do a few golden flits. We still pick a golden flit. You can, you can make this ID arbitrary, right? You can make this ID. Uh, per flit based as opposed to per packet based. Yeah. So you can optimize this. But this is really, really what you minimally need for uh, live lock freedom. If you want to get performance, that's a different issue. Yes? You can uh, You can make it fixed, right? I, I didn't understand what what would work. So which time stamp the flit rate? Exactly. Wh which slot is golden? Oh. Exactly. I mean that won't work because everybody, you, anybody can inject anything, and some, yeah, who knows uh, what is circling around, right? You need to give opportunity to any possible flit that's injected to become golden at some point in time. Basically, you need to circulate over ac across all of the slots. Becomes golden at some point. That's right. Basically, exactly, exactly. You're not signed as good. Exactly. You don't go inside as golden. You become golden while you're traveling in the system, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Basically, the uh, most packets. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly, yes. So no flits. In, in the common case, there are no flits that are go golden, actually. Because this slot is, this slot, because assuming that, assuming that you don't have a lot of load in the network, in the common case, this slot is pointing to something that's not in the network. <laughs> right. <laughs> if you have a lot of congestion, yes, then it's useful. So, so okay, so mm. let's assume that uh, yeah. it solves the live lock issue. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So basically, it's it's t times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, it's t times uh, the number of total slots, right? Yeah, that's the mac uh, that's the worst case time for a flit to become golden. And n number of total slots, if it's let's say I don't know, ten thousand, ten thousand times t. If t is five hundred, five hundred is a lot, by the way. It's five hundred times ten thousand, which is a lot. I agree, but it's usually not that bad. Let's say the minimum latency is two processes. Yes. Uh, in ideal case, three. And then you can give you T for any slot, any injection exactly. slot. Basically. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's T times number of you slots, basically. Like, uh, yeah. You will, you will, you will take the promised land at some 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. It may, take several time. it may take a lot of time. Yes, but this is all, all this is the minimal that you need. Yes. Well, basically, if there is not a lot of load in the network, you're identifying something to be golden, but probably that golden slot doesn't have a flit injected, right? These are basically, these are flits that you, 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 you may have injected into the network, but you don't necessarily have to at that point. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yes. Okay. Okay. Maybe, maybe this is not. Uh, oh, what do you mean? I mean, everything should go, should be able to go here, right? But if if some if two things go. Oh, north and east cannot go to north and east at the same time. That's what you're saying? Oh, I think it can, right? Yeah, I think it can. No, no, it says north and east, east can go south and north. Like left and oh, I see, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this, is, this, is, this simplifies the router even more. I mean, this is one example, but there are many permutation networks that you can potentially design. But our goal was to simplify the router even more. So you, you, you lose the you lose Exactly, you get more. So that's the trade-off we made in some, but, but there, uh, this is a design space actually. Exactly, that's a, that's a very good point. Uh, you're, with deflection router, you can actually be, uh, there's another benefit that I didn't talk about, but with a deflection-based router, you can be not correct all the time. You're basically making the trade-off that you're deflecting. And if it becomes golden, you will definitely go. <laughs> that's, the, that's the beauty of the golden one. Golden provides you live lock freedom, plus it gets you out of these situations that you somehow uh, design into the router. Okay, I didn't understand the cutting into half part, but maybe we can discuss that later on. Yeah. Okay, so hopefully it's clear now. Uh, okay, so the other issue is reassembly buffers. Uh, reassembly buffers actually cause a headache. Uh, every, uh, assume that you, in, the, in the worst case, every node sends a packet to only one receiver. So you have all of these nodes and sending nodes, and you have only one receiver and you have one packet in flight per node, you have all end space that's required in the receiver. Why can't we make reassembly buffers smaller? That's one issue, uh, one question we ask basically. What happens when reassembly buffer is too small? So you have many of these senders, and these are color coded, as you can see. They inject into the network, and let's assume that you have two entry reassembly buffers, and you have uh, two flits per packet. This may, what, uh, this may have happened, basically. Reassembly buffers are now full. This uh, flit is waiting for its pair. This flit is waiting for its pair in the receiver. Now these senders keep injecting, but the network cannot eject into the receiver because the buffer is full, and the senders keep injecting. And at some point, network becomes full, and you cannot inject new traffic, and you're basically deadlocked. Right? So you cannot make reassembly buffers arbitrarily small because that leads to a network deadlock. And which means that remaining flits must be injected for forward progress, but they cannot be injected. But because of that cycle, you're deadlocked now, right? So then the question is, how do you actually uh, avoid the deadlock? There are two fundamental ways of doing it, right? You can reserve space beforehand and then send it, or you can drop. Uh, so this is one example over here. Let's assume that what if every sender asks permission from the receiver before it sends? This increases your critical path latency for sending, of course. So the first question, sender says, receiver, May I reserve a slot, please? The receiver says, okay, I have a slot. I reserved it for you. And then sends it back. And then the sender now can send its flits eventually at they arrive at the router and they can use. So the downside of this is it adds additional delay to every request. And we don't want that necessarily. Yeah, this part of the network, yes. It yeah, it's also a flit, yeah. But it eventually it reaches, hopefully, because we provide live lock freedom. Yeah, so these are orthogonal problems, right? Okay, so the senders, uh, the other uh, way of solving this is you become optimistic in the sender. Basically, you assume that the buffer is free. 
if that's not true, the receiver drops and sends a negative acknowledgement and then the sender retransmits. So basically, let's take a look at this over here. Let's assume that the receiver is full, the assembly buffers. The sender sends two flits. One of them gets dropped and you get a negative acknowledgement and some other packets. So you get a negative acknowledgement, but uh, yeah, okay. We're gonna get back to that. The other, some other packet completes and the sender happens to retransmit this packet after some point. It just happens to decide that, and then it can get. And then now it gets an acknowledgement, and then the sender can free data. So as you can see over here, there's no additional delay in the best case. In the best case, there is a buffer that's free over here. That's good. But you need to have transmit buffering overhead for all packets. So you, you need to wait until NAC or ACK in this case, which means that the buffer, buffers over here become larger. So maybe we make these small, but these become larger now. And there are potentially many read transmits also in addition to this, right? Exactly, yeah, in this case. Don't wait for exactly. Well, well, we're going to fix that problem, basically. We, basically, the solution that we have is retransmitting only one, meaning you retransmit only when space becomes available. You had some coordination between the sender and the receiver. Receiver drops a packet if it's full. It notes which packet it drops. And when space frees up, receiver reserves space so that the retransmit is successful. That's the idea. And receiver notifies sender to retransmit, of course, in this case. So this is the idea. You have sender, receiver, sender sends. Receiver drops because it's full. And basically it says, oh, node zero wanted to send something to me. And uh, it sends the request zero. Uh, okay, it doesn't even need to note the request, but that's okay. Uh, and then later, a buffer becomes free over here. And then receiver reserves the slot for node zero request zero and tells the sender, now please send me whatever you really wanted to send. And then the sender sends at that point. So the upside of this is now uh, you get you got rid of a lot of retransmits over here. You still need to do some add some buffering over here, but it's not as bad as if you keep on re retransmitting many 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 times. Yes. So the the good uh, the realization that I will tell you is these retransmit buffers already exist in a cache based system. You usually request something from, let's say, a memory controller or a cache. So you need to keep track of what you have requested in a processor. So these are actually there <laughs> to begin with. The other realization is that these are also there. So basically these are reassembly buffers are really MSA chars, right? These are your mishandling, missed buffers. Whether you're accessing a cache or whether you're requesting something from some other node, these actually can be in integrated into that. You don't need to have separate buffering in any of this. In a, in a system that's on chip, and it, it core based and cache based. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you could optimize. We didn't look at it, but I think it depends on your communication patterns, right? When something arrives or when something doesn't arrive. <laughs> if I understood you correctly. But yeah, we can, we can take it offline, I think. Yeah. Okay, so basically, now, because these buffers already exist in the network, you're really a tr truly bufferless network. These retransmit buffers and receive buffers already are there. You're just managing them in a be better way. So it's really a truly bufferless network now. You don't need additional buffers. Okay, so what we've done basically, this is our baseline bufferless deflection router. We got rid of the long critical path, sorting by age, allocate spore sequentially with the golden packet and the permutation network over here. And we basically, large buffers, uh, uh, the problem here was large buffers for the worst case. And instead, we replaced them with tra retransmit once protocol and with cache miss buffers. And as a result, you have something like this now. 
Okay, so this is a more realistic evaluation than the previous one uh, that I mentioned. Uh, this is with a real router, and we, we're, we're gonna look at the latency of the router late, uh, also. Yeah, you can look at this. And we, we actually have very log models for different routers uh, and power models too. So this is the performance. Uh, this is multi-program workloads. You see buffered, less, and chipper. As you can see, uh, what does 13.6 mean? Uh, basically, uh, it's, it's, uh, you, you, your, your performance degradation compared to buffered network is about 13.6%. So as you can see, BLESS is better, but it's not implementable. Uh, this, is not, uh, this is really weighted speed up. It's not taking into account the frequency. Uh, and chip, uh, I, sh I shouldn't say it's not implementable. It's critical path is longer, but we're not taking into account critical path over here. Uh, so basically, we, we still get performance loss compared to buffered. It's about 13.6%, but it's not bad. We have a much, much more implementable router. And there are some cases, like this stream and MCF, basically you have 64 copies of stream and MCF that are injecting into the network. So it's actually pretty intensive over here. And this is a subset of 49 uh, total workloads and averages like across the full set, full, full 49. So the takeaway, we're not as good as buffered, as you can see, uh, with these intensive workloads, but we're not that bad also. So multi-threaded, as you can see, uh, in the multi-threaded, the injection rates are even lower. As a result, we don't actually lose that much when you, uh, when you build chipper. It's about 2%. Okay. Okay, so in, in very intensive workloads, the loss is very high, as you can see. But these are arguably not, uh, I mean, they could exist, but this is one problem with bufferless routing, actually. How do you handle, handle this very high load cases? It's not easy. Okay, there's minimal loss for medium, low to medium intensity workloads. So this is power reduction. Uh, this is the better news. As you can see, buffered is very high in terms of network power. Less reduced it, and chipper reduced it even more. So in terms of power, chipper is the most power efficient option. This reduces ne uh, network power by about 55%. And multi-threaded even more because multi-threaded workloads actually don't use the network that much. Okay. Okay, so this is the router area. Uh, you actually reduce the router area by about 36% compared to chipper. And this is the critical path of the router. So we are almost on par with a buffered router in this case, in the critical path. Uh, buffered router is really simple actually in terms of critical path because it does round robin uh, uh, allocation. Uh, from the different virtual channels. But bless actually increase the critical path, as I said, by 43% over here. Okay. Okay, basically, it, we maintain the area savings of bless and critical path become competitive to buffer. Okay, those are the conclusions. I think we've uh, discussed this. We talked about two key issues, live lock freedom and packet reassembly. And previous bufferless deflection routers were actually, in our opinion, high complexity and impracticable. All this first prioritization led to long critical path in the router and no end-to-end -end probe control for reassembly led to actually deadlock issues with reasonably side reassembly buffers. So Chipper is a new practical bufferless deflection router with golden packet prioritization, short critical path in router, retransmit once, deadlock free packet reassembly, and cache miss buffers as reassembly buffers so you get a truly bufferless network as a result of that. And you saw the results over here. Frequency is comparable and you get significant performance and well, significant power and area savings with hopefully minimal performance loss on applications that are not extremely intensive on the network. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, 64 by 64 is very large. I think we looked at 1024 at the maximum, but we didn't go more than, more than that. Yeah, 32 by 32, that's right. Okay, so uh, later actually we have a lot of work but I'm not gonna go into a lot of it. Basically, is this good enough? <laughs> the answer is I don't think this is good enough. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, basically this, this paper introduces silver. <laughs> so it's not only silver though, uh, it's actually, it's, it's good to buffer sometimes, basically. But you don't want the buffers to be the first option when you go into the router. Basically, if everything is going well, do bufferless as much as possible. But if you need to deflect sometimes, okay, that's why you may start putting things into the buffers. Right? Basically, once you run into congestion, you can use these side buffers. And that's one of the ideas in this paper, basically. 
uh, the high deflection rate hurts high performance at high loads. And basically, the idea over here is you have a side buffer to hold only flits that would have been deflected. Right? Uh, so there are multiple issues over here. There, there actually is an ejection bottleneck from the network as well. And this, this paper solves the ejection bottleneck. Whenever you're ejecting, actually, you can inject multiple things outside the network. And that helps a bufferless network a lot more than it helps a buffered network. Because bufferless network is using the links as buffers. And you would really like to remove stuff from the network as, as fast as possible. So what happens in a bufferless network is a packet arrives in the destination, and another packet arrives in the destination, and one of them gets deflected. And once that gets deflected, you're wasting a lot of network bandwidth to actually get that packet back into the destination. If you instead have a dual with ejection, and if you could eject both of the packets, suck them up, both of them, from out of the network, then you would gain a lot, gain a lot more performance. So that's one of the realizations over here. You want to basically take stuff out of the network very quickly. You could do that, exactly, yeah. So that basically, there are multiple ways of solving the problem. I, I absolutely agree. The fundamental problem is you don't want to, def you want to minimize the deflections, but you especially don't want to deflect when you're ready to take out something from the network, because that causes a lot of recircling outside uh, the destination. So that's one of the uh, ideas over here. And if you do this, do the, and the uh, right comparison is doing something similar in a buffered network, but that doesn't buy much in a buffered network, actually, because it doesn't run into this problem. Uh, so the other idea is a side buffer. Basically, well, whenever you have something deflected, you put it into the side buffer, and you have more bandwidth. But you can take a look at it. And this is a silver flit, two-level prioritization to avoid unnecessary deflections. So if you had just have one priority, golden, and everything else, you actually get to get into unnecessary deflections. If you have golden, silver, and you actually, even if you randomly pick the silver from one of your inputs, that's good because you ensure that that's not deflected, right? And you could actually do this with other priority levels. As long as you don't have complicated age-based comparisons, this, this works nicely. OK, so basically, this is the, uh, I'll give you the results, but the paper is also uh, over, uh, yeah, I think I have a link to the paper later on. But basically, we saw that you get significant power reduction and area reduction compared to buffered routers. And your performance is uh, much better compared to chipper. Bufferless route. Basically, you close half of the performance gap between, between buffered and bufferless, according to our results. So we're getting closer to the bufferless, uh, bu buffered routers right now with uh, much less power and area overhead. And we actually, there's a graph in the paper that shows that, that compares many routers and many configurations. It's, it shows that this gets the best energy efficiency of all the evaluated designs at competitive performance. I don't have the slides, but I think the ideas are hopefully reasonably clear. If you're really interested, you can take a look at the paper. Okay, and that's the paper. So as I said, we also looked at bufferless higher coolings. I think this actually, this now it looks at topology and buffering and flow control co-design at the same time. And I think this is actually uh, has a lot of scalability benefits. Uh, a lot of the other studies that we've been doing over here are on meshes. I don't think meshes are really great actually for on-chip networks. I, I, I think higher coolering, if you, with, you, if you design a higher coolering in a much better way, you can get, uh, get rid of uh, a lot of the issues that you have with meshes. Although meshes are very good, for, good with path diversity, but if you actually have multiple rings, you can actually do very well over here as well. And this is the much more extended version uh, of that paper. And we have a chapter that talks about that. So there's more readings. We actually looked at congestion control. Uh, so this paper actually looks at adaptive throttling. And I'll cover this paper, and then we'll take a break. Basically, we had later looked at throttling mechanisms. So one of the issues with bufferless networks is if you inject too much into the network, you also increase the deflection rate. So if you throttle just the right amount into the network, you actually uh, reduce the performance gap between buffered and bufferless routing also. And that's the idea over here. You cause congestion, reduce performance. So several observations we took advantage of, which I'm not going to go into the details. Some applications are more sensitive to network latency than others. Obviously, we saw that in memory scheduling, right? It's very similar here. And applications must be throttled differently to achieve peak performance. And that's the idea over here. We have a heterogeneous adaptive throttling mechanism. It's application-aware source throttling. You decide which applications inject when. And you look at the network load uh, to adjust the throttling rate. And basically, it improves performance and energy efficiency over throttling policies. And it gets buffered, these bufferless networks much closer to the buffered networks. Of course, it doesn't add. Uh, bandwidth into the network like what you did with minimally buffered deflection routing. You add more bandwidth because you, you have this dual with ejection and also bu some buffering in the network. But this, get, this, this uh, 
uh, get you away from those cases where you have a lot of deflections because you put a lot into the network and those things are circling around the network. Right? And if you're really interested, you can take a look at this work over here. Okay, any questions before we take a break? Okay, so let's take a break, maybe ele until 11, 11.05. Okay, let's say 11.05, and then we'll 